the success of previous expeditions, a new team gathers in January 2013 in Cabo San Lucas, Mexico, to embark on an eight-day trip in support of ocean conservation. William once again meets up with Dr. Mauricio Hoyos, this time to tag hammerhead sharks in the Rivia Afiquedo Islands. It will take them 24 hours to cover the 223 nautical miles to the first island of San Benedicto. It's interesting traveling these days, especially for these tagging expeditions, because I'm always bringing a lot of redundant equipment. And with the baggage restrictions on airlines, it's difficult. For example, this trip, I've got two pairs of fins, two three millimeter wetsuits, two five millimeter wetsuits, two spear guns, tagging shafts, biopsy shafts, tagging anchors, 20 tags. All of this so that 250 miles from shore, where there are no stores, no dive shops, I've got backups if something breaks down. So one of the interesting things about coming to an ecosystem like this, which is 24 hours from civilization, is you see an ecosystem that isn't impacted by the regular stress that large-scale human populations put on ecosystems. As their 24-hour journey reaches the inhabited island of San Benedicto, the team awakens before daylight to get an early start on the day's work. This is the first of only six days in which the team has to accomplish the goal of tagging as many hammerhead sharks as possible. Dr. Hoyos has high hopes for this expedition. It has been five years since he has been able to place transmitters on hammerheads in San Benedicto. So Mauricio contacted me 14 months ago about helping him here. It took us 14 months to put together the expedition boat and the funding to make this a reality. Now we can forget about all the challenges based in organizing and just be excited to be here. As well, we find the cleaning station and we're going to deploy more. So, Mauricio, can you not fire the gun when I'm down? Because if I'm lined up for a shot and you fire it for me, it will startle the animal and I'm about to shoot. I'm probably missing this attack. Got it. Excellent. Okay. Okay. Well, my goal is to assure the security of William. William plonge en expiration, on descend à peu près à 30 et 40 mètres. Moi, je descends à peu près une minute plus tard et je le rejoins et on monte ensemble. When freediving, safety is not optional. So having Philippe here to take care of my safety leaves me free to focus entirely on preparing for my dives. Lucas, do you have a tag ready? We have to set ultrasonic transmitter to these animals. It is like a cylinder of 20 centimeters. It has a feather and a blade. So we have to put this uh, transmitter with the feather and the blade in a slot at the end of a uh, spear gun. The first time of the day is the most difficult because you don't know what to expect. You don't know if the hammerheads are still around, you don't know how deep they are, and you don't know if you're going to encounter current. But regardless, I, every time I'm going into my first dive, I need to be ready. I need to be ready in case I encounter a hammerhead on that dive. I need to take advantage of that opportunity and place a tag. When the shark is close, we have to shoot to the left side of the shark at the base of the dorsal. The muscle wire is very thick in that part, so we don't want to hurt the shark. We haven't been able to tag this kind of hammerhead since a long time ago because it's a very difficult species to work with. They are very deep and uh, they are scared by the bubbles. And that's why I got in touch with William and uh, we need William's skills to tag the shark. If you get close to them and if you are not emitting a sound or bubbles, they do not know that you are there. Diving conditions in the bay proved to be very difficult. William and Philippe faced strong currents daily, which required them to fin constantly to maintain their position. Although the visibility is about 20 meters, the hammerhead sharks stayed deep, which requires William to dive to at least 25 meters in an attempt to locate them. This means both him and his safety diver are doing at least 40 to 50 dives per day but they only managed to safely place one to two tags per day.
One of the frustrations of doing tagging work in a location like this is that I miss out on spectacular underwater scenery and other animals that are present because I'm so focused on the task at hand. But uh, on this trip, I, I just could not resist when a giant manta ray swam in beneath me as I was dropping down to look for hammerhead sharks. Uh, we flew together for a brief moment until it finally glided away. Uh, and I was about to return to the surface when I spotted a hammerhead shark. I turned on the GoPro to document and swam over silently to successfully place another tag. The shark's skin will heal quickly from the tagging, sealing the tag anchor in place. The transmitter will remain active until the battery expires 18 to 22 months after activation. Another day comes to an end as the sun sets down the island of San Benedicto. The team heads back to the safety of the sea escape for a well-deserved rest. Part of expanding the Waterman Project to inspire, educate, and engage young people, the team welcomes 13-year-old Yasmin Mitsaksa and her father Angelos to the expedition. Well, yes, it's, it's a very new experience for her, so donning a wetsuit is challenging. All of this has been very, very challenging for her. Well, my dad knows William through um, training for freediving and apnea. And because of the Waterman project, um, I, my dad told me if I would like to come, and I'm like, okay, sure, because nobody else would never get an opportunity like this. In order to get the most out of this opportunity, Yasmin worked with William in a deep pool to refine her free diving skills prior to the expedition. Although this proved to be helpful, this could not prepare her fully for the difficulties of diving in open water or the animals she would encounter. First, I saw a hammerhead within the packing station, the cleaning station. It was far away, but I managed to see it swimming. Then, uh, we've seen lots of manta rays, which is really cool. They, were, they have really big wingspan, and they're really fun to play with. And then, um, I saw a tiger shark, which is really close. We rolled about a lot of people free diving together, and just I turned around, and four meters away was a tiger shark. You know, here's a 13-year-old girl who sees uh, almost four-meter tiger shark, and it's just tiger shark, tiger shark, tiger shark. She's excited, and and she's asking, me, are they are they dangerous? That's very different from my generation. I grew up with tiger sharks are voracious man eaters. They're psychopathic killing machines. She doesn't have that stigma, so it's very clear that she comes from a different generation. After a long day of diving, Yasmin and the team listen to Dr. Hoyos as he explains different aspects of his research and shark behavior specific to the animals the group will encounter. Yasmin is not the only student joining the expedition. Lucas Mueller, a 22-year-old German marine biology student, was also invited to join the team to expand his knowledge and experience of sharks. About three weeks ago, I got a phone call uh, by William, and he said, uh, you want to come tagging sharks in three weeks and diving with them? I was like, sure, but I don't have the money, I don't have the means. And then he said, uh, I'm offering you a scholarship. And I was like, wow, this is just uh, amazing. We booked the flights right away, and uh, now I'm here. It's uh, an amazing opportunity. William saw that I have passion for sharks, and he's giving me the perfect opportunity to study them and have a great experience. This is knowing that what William and Marisa do is a hard work. It's really good to see uh, for my future uh, that it's not only going to be fun diving with dolphins and playing with sharks, it's also going to be rough work and day-to-day -day job. And it really gives me a perspective on what my future will look like.
William tags the shot, he'll need a new tag, so I'll give it to him. I prepare it for him. I'll take off the magnet that keeps the tag inactive as long as it's still in the boat. 34 meters of depth, feed that, and 2.8 meters. William gives Lucas the details of the tagging, length and sex of the animal, as well as time and depth. Once back on the boat, this information will be entered into the computer so Dr. Hoyos can maintain a detailed record of all animals tagged for his research. Placing transmitting tags on the scalloped hammerhead is the priority of this expedition, but it is equally important to ensure that all submarine receiver stations are in place and working. These stations will record the data from each tagged animal as they pass by the receiver. As soon as we tag the shark, the transmitter is going to send an ultrasonic pulse that is going to be recorded in a device that is called VR2W. It's a submarine station. So we set these stations all over the archipelago at a depth of between 20 and 30 meters. And these stations are going to record and store all the information about, about the movements and behavior of these animals. We are collecting this data because we need information uh, to give uh, the Mexican government the tools to uh, write specific uh, management plans for every species. Scientific work is one aspect of ocean conservation, but capturing this ecosystem on film to share with the general public is another aspect. We try to capture images on film and, and photograph to share with people what it's like to, to have a four meter great white shark swim directly at you, but there is no replacement for actually being there on a single breath of air, and that's the, you know, the beauty of breathful diving is that you're quiet, you're almost part of that animal's world. You don't have any noisy bubbles, you don't have a noisy regulator, and you have that freedom to, to move in its environment with it. Um, it changes your relationship with the animal. It changes your relationship with the sea. Inviting groups of young people to take part in these expeditions is the next logical step for the Waterman Project. By helping them to understand the importance of these animals to our planet and giving them the chance to form a relationship with the sea, it is hoped that they will pass the message onward to future generations. kill sharks. Oh. Yeah, sharks are afraid of dolphins, typically. Don't be shy. I have a question for you guys. How many sharks do we have in our country? Do we have sharks in our country? Yeah. How many? Yes. 200. I mean types of sharks, not numbers of sharks. How many types of sharks do we have? <laughs> How many? How many different species of sharks do we have? Oh, come on. Five, 20, 80. Woo, no. geez, now we're getting up. We have 30, 30 species of sharks in Canada. About 10 of them are common. 
on the East Coast and the West Coast and a couple species way up north. 30 species. We do have great white sharks. And great white sharks. Oh. Yeah, on the East Coast. Yes. Uh, how many places have you traveled to for shark tagging? How many places, uh, how many places have I to traveled to for shark tagging? Probably about a dozen, 12 to 15 different locations. We've tagged a couple hundred sharks, which is a lot. The last expedition there, we placed 10 tags. It was very, very difficult work. Yes? My favorite place to dive is Guadalupe Island, of Mexico, because of the great white sharks. I love diving with great white sharks. Yes? Does it hurt? So does it hurt when we tag the sharks? How many of you had a tetanus shot or something like that from the doctor? Did it hurt? It's about the same thing. The size of the spear shaft that penetrates their skin to place the tag in relation to their body size is about the same between us and a hypodermic needle. Yes? What does it take to become a marine biologist? Sean? I'm not a marine biologist. <laughs> I'm just a dude. <laughs> uh, marine biology, you go to university and you train to be a scientist. But, yeah, so, so you, you study at university for several years and you do research and you decide, uh, you, you study the science and you decide how in-depth you want to go. But having said all of that, that what William just pointed out is the important thing. You don't need to be a marine biologist to help the ocean or to like the ocean, right? William's not a marine biologist and he likes the ocean. Lawyers help the ocean. Plumbers help the ocean. Stay-at-home mom and dads help the ocean. It's all about it's all about knowing that the ocean is there and taking responsibility for how you live. But if you want to study the ocean, that's a whole different game that takes some, some work and it, and it involves becoming a scientist. And something you should know, if you're relying on us, the CWF, and science to protect the oceans, we're all dead. It's going to require your involvement. It's going to require everybody, even on a corporate level, because it's a big problem. And you guys actually have more leverage and more clout than we do. Because business, corporations, and governments care about what you think. You're the next generation of voters, you're the next generation that's going to be perhaps sitting in office, working in corporations, heading up corporations. They do care about what you have to say. And you guys are the ones that are savvy about social media. When I grew up, cellular phones didn't exist. I was ecstatic when the first cordless phone came into existence. If you guys were, do you guys do reports and stuff in school? You type them out on your computers? I did them on typewriters. And the spell check is a book, it's called a dictionary. And the only reason you would look in the dictionary is because you knew you misspelled something. Books, when you didn't know you misspelled something. I used to get a lot of reports back with a lot of corrections. We have a question online, William, right yeah. here. They want to know, um, how does the tiger shark not kill humans? So how or why? How and why? Yeah, does the tiger shark not kill humans? So how and why do tiger sharks not kill humans? Well, the reason being is that tiger sharks are not out there hunting us. Any problems that have happened with tiger sharks and humans has been a case of mistaken identity. And let's go to the film Soul Surfer, because I'm sure a lot of you have seen that. Young lady who lost part of her arm to a tiger shark. Well, the history behind that quote, attack, she was surfing in a river mouth surf break, which means there's a river emptying into the sea where she was surfing. So on a tropical island, it's in Hawaii, they had a lot of heavy rainfall. When you have heavy rainfall, you get a lot of mud and silt coming into the sea, so the visibility is very poor. You also get a lot of dead small animals, mice, rats. You get a lot of fecal matter, the kinds of things that attract sharks. Now, when you go in the water as a surfer, your eyes are not under the water. You're looking out for the waves. And every now and then, you make an explosive series of movements called paddling that attract sharks. So you add all of those factors and you get, oops, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to take your arm. I thought you were dinner. And honestly, if tiger sharks and great white sharks were man-eaters, how is it possible for us to do what we do in the water with them? And I've been swimming with sharks for almost 30 years. I've been face-to-face, -face, inches away from a five-meter great white shark. I even had a great white shark think I was a shark. 
How is that possible? Yes, you had a question? Okay. Yes. Do you have uh, any other accolades or anything you do um, you know, that, that help promote you to be, the, be able to hold the, the air that you can hold for nine minutes? Okay, so how did I arrive here? No, like, no have you, like, Samantha mentioned that you might have a record or something that, that uh, you hold for holding your breath. Well, I hold a world record for variable ballast, which is the video that your class watched. Okay. I have a world record for constant weight with bifins. I have a historic world record, which was, um, it's not a ratified competitive discipline, but in Egypt there's a hole, it's called the Blue Hole. At 60 meters of depth, there's a 30 meter long passageway. So I swam it without fins, I was the first to do it. Swam down 60 meters, 30 meters through, and 60 meters back out. Can you give your other depth record? Um, I hold Pan American record for swimming down without fins, it's, what is it, 86 meters? I don't remember. I've had about 24 Pan American records, uh, 26 national records, 26 North American records, sort of coming and going. And what's the normal way? Can I make tea the tiger shark gas? A nine minute record. Uh -huh. <laughs> so here's the trick. First, don't do this at home. Don't do it alone. Because if you hold your breath for too long, you will black out. And if you're in the water and you're alone, you become a statistic. Secondly, the reason we can hold our breath, for me it's a lot of training. Right now I couldn't hold my breath for nine minutes. I could probably pull off a six minute breath hold. If I want to go back to a nine minute breath hold, I need to train specifically targeting the things unique to that discipline. But we all have something that whales, dolphins, sea lions, and marine mammals have. It's called a mammalian diving reflex. So, if you hold your breath, put your face in the water, your heartbeat slows. If you dive under the surface of the water, a few other things take place. Your body shuns blood out of your arms and legs, prioritizing it to the heart, the brain, and the lungs. For the heart and brain, it's so that the heart keeps beating in the brain so you stay conscious. For the lungs, that blood is overinflating the blood vessels to protect the lungs from the pressure. Now, the degree of strength of that reflex depends on how much diving you've done, how much time you've spent in the water. If you don't spend time in the water, your dive reflex is probably 10% of what it could be. Somebody like me, I've been diving my entire life, so my dive reflex is quite strong, and it doesn't take much to trigger it to activate. Whereas people that don't dive a lot, it takes a lot of diving to trigger it. But that's one way that you figure out how to hold your breath for nine minutes. Yes? Have you ever gotten hurt by a shark? I lost this leg two years ago. Kidding. I've never been bitten. I've never been, I've never had any issues with sharks. Yes? <laughs> Emma, the tiger shark. Have I ever been emotionally hurt by a shark? Um, we were dating after that encounter for a while, but she met a, a young shark. And <laughs> yes, at the back. Is it difficult to stay focused you mean the tag of work? Okay, so is it difficult to stay focused on what we're doing when we're holding our breath? Uh, no. Actually, the very nature of breath hold diving is you have to pay attention. And the nature of working with sharks is you have to pay attention all the time, particularly great white sharks. Have, have any of you ever tried to meditate? A simple meditation is to count the number of breaths up to ten. Then again and again, at a certain point, you will space out, you'll lose your ability to concentrate. So when we're diving with great white sharks, when that moment arrives, when we can no longer pay 100% attention to what we're doing, sharks start coming at us from all angles. Not to attack us, not to aggress us, but to seize an opportunity to get close to us without risking, because they pick up on the fact that we're not able to pay attention and focus. And that's when we get out of the water. So the great whites, we always pay 100% attention. 
Timing. There are so many things that we're paying attention to. It's it's not a mindless activity. It's really 100% focus all the time. So there is a certain limit to that, and that's when we stop doing the work. We get out of the water and take a break. Yes. Uh, a lot of stuff. Mainly, let me pull up. Um, uh, what have we learned from tagging? So what you have here, if you look here, that's the island of Malpelo. It's governed by Colombia. Here you have the island of Cocos, and here you have the Galapagos. Cocos is governed by uh, Costa Rica, Galapagos by Ecuador. All of these areas are what are called marine protected areas. Malpelo has a 25 mile restricted zone. You cannot fish, you cannot hunt, you cannot do anything in there. Now, scallop hammerheads you won't find in Mount Palo, but you only find them seasonally. So the question is, where do they go? Now, they're protected here, but they're not protected here or over here when they migrate. The mapping that you see here is a three and a half meter female scallop hammerhead. This was from tagging that we did in 2008. We tagged 46. Uh, scalloped hammerheads. The scientists had theorized that the sharks that you would see as a tourist diver in Mount Palo were the same sharks you were seeing here and the same you were seeing, same you were seeing here. But they didn't have any scientific information. They didn't have any scientific data to prove it to governments. Um, and this is only one shark. Um, we have tracks because there was eight satellite tags placed, which would show this kind of mapping. Um, satellite tag will show the real track that the animal took. The other tags we use are acoustic tags. They was require, as Dr. Hoyos said in the film, a receiver placed around the island and sometimes along coastal regions, whereby when the animal with the tag swims by a receiver, it emits a signal, which the receiver records. And we had hammerheads showing up all along this coastline. What it showed was that, although this is nice to protect them here, it's limited, and it really isn't going to do the job. What we need is this entire eastern Pacific corridor to become a marine protected area. And that's what's been going on in terms of lobbying these governments since 2008. So. And this is taking place in different regions. I was just in Bimini, Bahamas, tagging great hammerhead sharks for the same reason. Great hammerheads are extremely fragile species, and they're often caught as bycatch in commercial fisheries. And the research lab that is located on South Bimini Island has been noticing a steady decline in the numbers of great hammerheads showing up in Bimini during that season. Because they are such a fragile species, it's in, well, you can fish them. You can catch them on a, on a rod and reel, bring them to the boat to place a tag, but chances are 50% of the sharks that you tag will die just from that experience. So we decided to collaborate with them to place the tags using our techniques, which is quite uh, benign for the animal, in hopes that we'll figure out where they go when they leave Bimini. The theory is that they're going up the east coast of the U.S. If they are, then this information will be given to fisheries to put closures on certain commercial fishing practices where the hammerheads become bycatch in order to protect them. So, yep. so we have similar work that goes on in Canada as well. So we're tagging sharks on the east coast and the west coast of Canada. It, exactly the same situation as William is describing in the areas he's working. <clears throat> in Canada on the east coast, we have basking sharks, which are filter feeding sharks that can be as wide as this room. And certainly most of them are, are from me to the wall in length, eight to 10 meters in size, enormous sharks. And we've tagged a number of these sharks. We have no idea where they were. They show up in Canada in the summer, and then they're gone in the winter. We don't know where they went. It turns out they go off the continental shelf, go down to 1,000 meters or deeper in the ocean, and head south underneath all the cold water and then back up in the warm parts. We have, we have no idea until we do this type of research that William's involved with and start looking at where animals move in, in, this parts of the, in these parts of the world. We just have no idea. 
very important work. Like having great whites in Canadian waters. And, and great whites we recently had. Yeah, Lydia, Lydia is the name of a great white shark that got tagged down off North Carolina. And everybody in Canada freaked out when she went and did a beeline straight north to Newfoundland and started swimming around Newfoundland. And everybody was panicked. And they were asking the scientists, they're like, has this ever happened before? And the scientists are like, we've never looked at great white sharks. We don't even know. But chances are, yes, there's lots of seals up in, in Newfoundland and Canada. Great white sharks love seal, seal snacks. So uh, almost definitely. Yes. yes. What happens to a shark's body after it dies? I'm guessing it gets eaten. <laughs> After about 18 to 22 months, the tag is dead. No. Can I just say, sharks are, sharks are one of the most bizarre animals on this planet. They're so different from everything else. They don't have bones, eh? They have cartilage. So when they die and, and dissolve, uh, you know, break down, the only thing that survives are their teeth. Like dinosaur sharks, like Megalodon, which was a, a, white, a, a white shark the size of this room or bigger, the only thing we have left of that is its teeth because the shark's body just completely disintegrates. There's no bones or anything. They're crazy animals. Crazy. Yeah. The largest was a seven meter great hammerhead. Or just great white was six meters. Yes? What qualifications do you need to do in my job? You need to be a dude. You need to serve. No, I'm kidding. Um, to do specifically the tagging or to dive with the sharks? If you want to dive with sharks, um, you're welcome to join us on an expedition. You just have to be able to pay for your spot on the boat, which, for example, for the Great White Shark Expedition, it's about four to $5,000. That pays the cost of the boat. It's not a for-profit operation, but the boats for the Great White tagging is about $12,000 a day. For the Remiagigados, it's about $4,000. That gets you a spot on the boat. Uh, you get to observe the research. You get to come in the water. You can either scuba dive. If you know how to free dive, you can free dive. Um, you, know, you can do that. You don't have to be well accomplished. If you want to tag, you need to have a, a good, solid history of time in the water. You need to understand the sea experientially, not intellectually. You need to know how to dive really well. You need to be able to dive to 25 meters. Lucas, the German marine biology student, he reached out to me several years ago. And I receive emails and messages from young people that are interested in stuff. And I, I reply to all of them. And usually I reply with questions of my own. and. I say there are looky loos people that are just kind of fishing, and then there are people that are really serious. And Lucas was one of those people. His dream was to dive with great white sharks. And he wants to do what we're doing. So on that expedition, I had him come in the water. Now, he's been training in Germany. There's a 20-meter deep tank. He's doing free diving courses. He's going and training with his brother. His brother's a graphic artist. His brother didn't care about free diving. He's like, you're going to free dive because I need a training partner. So now his brother free dives, and he showed up, and he was ready, and he was going to show me his stuff. And I said, OK, well, I'm not going to let him tag, because tagging is very specific. It's a very small window of where we can place the tag, but I'll let you take tissue samples. So I gave him a spear gun for him to load the band. He couldn't. So he got out of the water, and he went, Ugh. So what can I do in the gym to? To, to be able to do that. I said, I'll tell you about that later. Then I asked him, because we had a line, finally we put a line in a float so we could hold on to something in the current. And I said, I want you to dive to 20 meters and hang there. So he dove down, and I looked at Philippe, who was doing my safety, and I said, does that look like 20 meters to you? He goes, no, it's more like eight. So I swam down, and I went, yep, it's eight. <laughs> Lucas comes up, and I said, uh, <clears throat> 20 meters. Because his whole experience is in a pool that's 20 meters deep. So I said, OK, hang on. You go to examine, go down, and you come down right after me and meet me. So I went down to 21 meters. And I'm looking, and he's looking at me, and I'm looking, and then I see him pop his head up and talking to Philippe, and then Philippe goes, and I come back up, and Lucas says, I'm, I'm, I'm never done with 40 meters. I'm not diving to 40 meters. And I showed him the gauge. I said, Lucas, that's 21 meters. Oh, crap. What if he 
Oh, John, you're going to 40 meters. I said, I'm diving twice that depth. Okay. So he relaxed and breathed up. It took him about 10 minutes, and then he managed to get down to 21 meters, but he couldn't stay there. So there's a whole progression and evolution that takes place in your comfort and your ability to dive before you could even think about tagging. But we are looking for people to replace us. And at the moment, we have more demand for tagging expeditions than we have funding and than we have time to do. Because all of this is volunteer. We don't get paid to do this. So when I'm tagging, I'm not working. I'm not earning. So there is a limit to how much that we can volunteer. Yes? From your knowledge, do you think that sharks can travel down the St. Lawrence and the Lake Ontario? Travel down the St. Lawrence. Do you think sharks can travel down the St. Lawrence? Why not? Depends on the species. Bull sharks could, but I think it's too cold here. The Greenland sharks, do they? I think Greenland sharks travel down the St. Lawrence. Probably only as far as Tadasak. They probably won't go into the lake. But they may occasionally show up further beyond, sort of lower in the St. Lawrence River. But it's all about being able to tolerate fresh water. It's uh, yeah. very difficult physiologically. Up the Tadasak, it's very marine. South of that, it really becomes much more possible, highly unlikely. What else do you get besides the location? So, what else do we get besides location from tagging the shark? Um, we get location, we get the frequency that they're in an area. So with receivers placed in front of a seal colony, you see how often the sharks are there hunting. But some of the sensors will tell us depth, time. Uh, there are other sensors that will show ex acceler acceleration, things like that. We have a question from the okay. as well. They wanted to know about tiger sharks. Um, what's the conversation <laughs> um, with tiger sharks? <laughs> They're grade one and two class. Okay. And they want to know how many teeth they have, how many fins they have, and how big they are. So maybe you can talk about tiger sharks a little bit. I don't know how many <laughs> teeth they have. A yeah. lot. What they have. The thing that's interesting about, about all sharks, especially tiger sharks, they have they probably have thousands of teeth. They constantly grow teeth. They have teeth all over their skin. All sharks, the skin of sharks is modified teeth. They have that's when you touch the, the yeah. skin of a shark, it's like sandpaper. It's because their teeth have actually modified and their skin grow teeth all around them, just small. And tiger sharks have have a, a tooth that looks like this. They're serrated like a, a knife blade. And they're one of the few sharks that are able to bite through sea turtle shells. So they can take bites out and bite right through a sea turtle shell. So they've, they've got one of the most powerful bites and the sharpest teeth of, of all the sharks. How many teeth do they have? In a sense, they have an infinite number because they constantly grow them. They lose their teeth all the time. All sharks do this, of course, and, they're, and they just grow more teeth out as they lose them all the time. I don't yes. know what, how, you can talk about how big they are. Well, the smallest I've ever seen was one and a half meters. I didn't know it was a tiger shark. So it was like, oh my god, he's really big. I gotta get out of here. Uh, biggest was almost five meters that I've ever seen. Number of fins, would they have seven? Two? Two pectoral fins? Dorsal fins? Dorsal fin, tail fin, caudal fin. fins? Six? Seven? Seven. Thanks. What is this, a test? <laughs> yes? Tough question. <laughs> Sorry? Do you know how sharks communicate with one another? The smartphones. <laughs> um, as far as I've observed, uh, there's no sounds coming from sharks, but they communicate via body language. For example, and I was talking about the shark, thinking I was a shark. Um, around the boats, when we anchor in Guadeloupe, there is a social hierarchy. So if a big shark shows up, the little guys have to leave. Okay? If the little guy doesn't leave, what you'll see happen is the big shark will swim up to the little shark and roll its belly like this, showing it's bigger. So the experience that I had where I realized that this, it was a five and a half meter female shark, and I realized that she was thinking that I was a shark. I was at 20 meters. And she swims in, and so I'm staying there because I want to have this interaction. She swims up to me, and she starts rolling her belly at me. And I'm looking at her, hey, sweetheart, I get it. You're five and a half meters. I'm like a meter 87. Uh, I, I got it. And I know what she wants. She wants me to swim down and stay near the bottom. But i got to breathe. So I'm like, I'm, I, no disrespect. <laughs> I'm going to go up there. So I swam out. 
She swam off and turned around. Now what they do if the smaller shark doesn't acquiesce is they gnash their teeth. So I'm filming her because she's swimming at me and my arms are locked so I can stabilize the camera and I've got a little viewfinder and I can see she's doing something but I'm not sure. Oh no. So we're now escalating. So she's frustrated at me because I'm back on the surface. She's gnashing her teeth. Well, if the smaller shark doesn't get it after the teeth gnashing, it's just a big chomp on the head. Which you can imagine what that would do to little old me. So I realized I had no choice. I either have to deal with her or I have to get out of the water. So I know, and you might find this surprising, when you fire the shutter of a camera in the housing, it's like a <laughs> It scares them. So I fired the, the shutter and thrust the camera at her, swimming at her, aggressing her, and she took off. And then we waited. And about an hour later, she swam in. And it was funny because there was three of us in the water, and she pulled back to went, oh, it's you. And swam over, and it was kind of like, OK, we can coexist. And then I had you know, three, four hours with her swimming and interacting. It was the big female that was seen in the, in the film. I think we have to wrap it up yeah. there, actually. William, they have, they have to get, get moving along. Just one thing I'll, I'll just quickly say is um, we have a, a website, a Wild About Sharks website at, at CWF. If you do a search for it, you'll find it. They have a test. Just, just one second. So uh, what I'll do is I'll post it. And I'll make sure that it uh, 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 gets out to everybody. But uh, just before we go, I'd just like to uh, thank William for coming in. And uh, uh, what, a, what an awesome <laughs> I want to say that if, uh, if you have questions after the fact, feel free to, they can send you emails and you can forward them through to CWF and myself. We're happy to respond to questions. And, and for a few minutes, we'll go to the, to the spectrum into the lobby there, where we'll uh, be there. So if somebody had some personal questions you want to talk to just before you talk. Uh, we'll be out there for a few minutes as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.